Hi guys, I'm Pratyush Hande, Senior Growth Marketer and Product Evangelist at Netco Solutions, your host and one of your moderators for this very very unique event today. On behalf of Netco, I extend a warm welcome to all our attendees across the Southeast Asia region, our esteemed panelists and my fellow Netcoians. Ladies and gentlemen, the last 3 months have been unprecedented and unpredictable. as we continue to come to grips with the covid-19 crisis this has really pushed brands to adapt evolve and pivot but it's the cxo level that will play a key role in navigating a course back to regrowth and at the foundation of this regrowth is digital transformation while consumer behavior purchase patterns and usage habits have changed customer expectations remain fairly straightforward and as a b2c brand you still need to deliver customer satisfaction you still need to make your customers feel special and you still need to deliver unique personalized customer experiences at scale how cxo leadership responds to the new normal while reshaping budgets strategies and teams will impact who captures greater market share mind share and wallet share moving forward and set in this backdrop We at Netco Smartec, a leading AI-powered omni-channel personalization and marketing automation platform, want to continue to empower you, and that's the vision with which we've put together this CXO virtual roundtable for Southeast Asia, where we talk about how you can realign your business growth and marketing strategies during these testing times and beyond. So we have the who's who. leaders across industries from southeast asia who will share actionable insights on how you should respond to consumer behavior changes building pandemic proof businesses customer acquisition versus retention and how you can reshape marketing budgets strategies and talent acquisition amongst many other things we hope that these razor sharp insights help you reimagine growth for your brands not just for the remainder of 2020 but beyond that as well welcome once again to netcore's cxo virtual round table for southeast asia where we help you navigate your path to regrowth just for context and clarity we have two action packed and insightful panel discussions lined up for today and the first panel discussion will revolve around the change in consumer behavior so what do you need to do next to counter this new normal or do you go about business as usual joining me today on this panel i have a bunch of cxos and leaders across southeast asia marketing initiatives in singapore across lazada and redmart with vast experience in marketing and e-commerce across the apac region jean has previously worked at vigo vinomofo and smart by glasses Thank you so much for taking the time and being a part of this insightful panel discussion, Jean. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Our next panelist is Mr. Sandeep Mishra, CEO of Sinamas Cognitive and Big Data. Sandeep is an experienced telecom and big data professional and has handled leadership roles across both mature and emerging markets in Southeast Asia. He specializes in PNL management, digital transformation, AI ML for telecom and customer life cycle management. Welcome Sandeep. Thank you so much for joining us on this August panel. I'm sure our audience will have lots to learn from you. Thanks Pradeep. Look forward to the discussion. Our next speaker is Ms. Olia, co-founder and CMO of Storyal.co. Storyal is a social storytelling platform that allows writers to directly publish digitally. get feedback from readers and monetize their books a linkedin power profile 2017 in marketing olia has also been the woman marketer of the year at the asia ywn marketing awards 2019 and through her initiatives olia continues to revolutionize the writing and publishing industry in indonesia thank you so much for joining us olia today and welcome to the panel discussion thank you bro and our next speaker 
Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Wong Quen, the founder and CEO at Feroche.vn, the first e-commerce website in Vietnam that specializes in medium and high-end designer fashion. Feroche provides sales channels and media support solutions to more than 200 fashion brands within Vietnam. And with over 10 years of experience in e-commerce, market research, and strategic marketing, Ms. Wong has held senior management positions in major regional companies such as Aderoy and Pico. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Wong, and welcome to our panel discussion. Thank you. And finally, we have our very own Mr. Abhitabh Bhaskar, CEO International Business at Netco Solutions. Abhitabh is a startup specialist, strategist, and proven business leader with over two decades of global exposure in the US, Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Europe. He's been associated with Netcore for over 17 years now. In his current role, he has been instrumental in expanding the global footprint for Netcore with an indirect presence in over 20 countries and a direct presence across key markets such as USA, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, UAE, and Nigeria. Welcome, Abhitab. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence today. I'm sure you also have a lot to add to this panel discussion. Yeah, thanks, Pratyut. Look forward to All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, those uh, introductions are now out of the way. I am actually personally thrilled to be in the August company of you guys. Uh, the way we are going to be doing it is we will take the questions in the order in which I introduced you. Uh, you can then provide your insights and then we move on to the next speaker. And without further ado, um, you know, we've seen how this entire COVID-19 pandemic has taken everybody by surprise. You know, it has compelled digital brands to closely monitor and analyze their customer data across industries to pay careful attention to evolving consumer behavior trends. So my first question to you is, how have these consumer behavior trends evolved with respect to your company and industry? We'll start with Jean. I think when it comes to um, fashion industry, right? Um, obviously, if we if we look at what we've been doing as an omnichannel company, uh, obviously, like all the offline side of things, been uh, shut down. Now reopened mostly, but was shut down for for almost two months. Um, which obviously like A, it's changed the behavior of people that, you know, only shop offline to actually shop uh, online for the first time. So I think that's the, the first part, uh, which is quite um, relevant, which actually, you know, I think for the future is somewhat good, you know, that people are transitioning from only offline shopping to trying online. And then in the future, there'll be uh, customers both of online and, and offline. So I think that's the first change that we saw. The, the second one is like, uh, in terms of online, in terms of like what kind of product people are buying, you know, like uh, obviously you're not going to buy your next um, swimsuit or flower dress to go on holidays when, you know, basically you have to stay home for the next two months. So typically like, you know, anything around like skincare, um, sportwear, um, any type of like stay at home type of clothing really um, been performing um, very, very well. Um, Actually, the third thing I would say is on, on e-com, I mean, we saw uh, exponential growth of, of e-commerce. Um, to give a bit of data, I mean, from the moment we close the stores to then, you know, I suppose having only e-commerce, our e-commerce grew almost 120% month on month. So actually, like, um, the, the, the growth was, was massive when it came to, um, to e-com. Um, then the, the fourth one, right, is like, obviously, you know, as a fashion company, you, you do have a lot of constraints because of your inventory. So obviously with, uh, with COVID, the, the issue you have is like maybe some of the stuff that you bought, you know, heavily before for people to go on holiday and so forth might not be relevant. So you kind of like have to go through a clearance type of strategy uh, to kind of like move the inventory away uh, during COVID, which is something we've been um, doing. And then on the, all the essential items from home, you kind of like have to find way to get uh, more inventory on, on this. Um, and then lastly, I would say it's around engagement, right? It's like, you know, I think you, we saw people kind of like connecting with different type of content, um, you know, as well in terms of like 
uh, keeping themselves engaged. You know, I think nobody want to see someone going on holiday when you're stuck at home for the next two months. So we've been trying to adjust the strategy so then the content is, you know, engaging and, um, um, you know, also like, you know, kind of like keep people excited, basically, like, you know, with the moment and then thinking that, you know, it's good to stay home, you know, it's good to take care of yourself and then, you know, we'll come out of this uh, stronger. So that's kind of like, I would say there's a few points uh, around that. Ah, that's interesting, especially the point that you made about how it's important to personalize your communication, your recommendations, but also keep a close handle on how you manage your inventory. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's a fine balancing act. So I think that's a very relevant insight there. Thanks so much, Jean. Uh, we'll now move to uh, Sandeep, who can share some insights on this, uh, particularly for the telecom industry. Sandeep, the mic is all yours. Yeah. So telecom uh, was going through the digital transformation for uh, last few years. But what COVID has done uh, in last three months is it has really expedited this the whole speed at which it was happening. Uh, so now for the telcos, not only they have to support the increase in traffic, which we are seeing because of customers doing most of their purchases and most of the service uh, services they are buying through digital. Not only we have to support that increase in traffic, but we have to also offer a digital platform where customers can can you know, meet the requirements which they have because knowing that they can't go out in the lockdown situation. So whether you talk about education, you talk about banking, you talk about e-commerce, or you talk about even buying a SIM card, you know. So uh, what COVID has done in last three months is it has challenged the telcos to 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 keep up to us to, to the speed and you know meet customers' expectation and stay relevant in the market. And since right. all it happened quite suddenly, uh, it was it was a big challenge for the telcos in the beginning because one they were dealing with the increased traffic. And if you see some of the some of the Southeast uh, Southeast Asian market, the traffic in these last three months has increased considerably. So that right. means people are moving their uh, their purchases, their their you know the, even the entertainment etc. is all happening. A lot of it is happening on mobile. So they had to do that. Uh, the, the, the core the core uh, work of providing the pipe or providing the bandwidth to the customer. Right. But at the same time, they had to offer new services in all key spaces of uh, you know, customer expectation. So that is on the on the telco side. On the customer side, of course, the expectations have also changed drastically in the last three months. Uh, if you take the whole value chain, uh, whether it is onboarding, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, experiencing the service or having a problem and getting it resolved, uh, everything is happening digitally. So customer's expectation is that my problem should be solved as uh, soon as possible and uh, my company should know me in and out, I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be wasting too much of time in updating it. What's my problem? So that's right. where companies are using a lot of AI, ML, a lot of machine learning algorithms, and getting to know what what are the issues which customers are having, and addressing it from time to time. So these are the two key two key changes which I have seen on the on the company side, on the telco side, as well as on the customer side. That's that's so apt because uh, you know we saw that meme floating around that said that who is the catalyst of digital transformation for you in 2020? Someone says CMO, someone says CTO, someone says CEO, but it's actually COVID-19 and customer expectations that have increased. So very valuable insights there. Uh, uh, we now move to uh, Ms. Olya. Uh, the question remains the same. What are some of the key consumer behavior changes that you have seen specific to uh, your particular subdomain of e-commerce? Yeah, uh, Pradyut, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Storial is in uh, publishing uh, industry, uh, but digitally, right? So, as we know, uh, a lot of stores uh, in uh, pandemic. Because right. A lot right. of um, a lot of customers, uh, a lot of users are now trying uh, reading digitally, right? So because they need to to keep themselves entertained because they become bored and bored at home. So uh, we see uh, we see uh, our readership uh, increase by three three x since the pandemic, basically. So that means uh, new readers and uh, numbers of chapters read uh, by them, right? And people also spend more time, like forty percent longer time, uh, on our platform. So they they read more. 
Uh, and also, uh, we, we see that writers, because they cannot like work with uh, um, traditional publisher now, because right. of the uh, sales of prints uh, going down, right? So mm -hmm. they, start uh, they start to work with us. Uh, they're willing to work with us. And also, uh, we see the increase of writers that write for the first time uh, increase 95% uh, in, in our platform. So people actually trying to uh, reflect in this situation and also try to re, uh, to write, you know, because as you know, our platform is a user generated uh, content. Correct. Yeah? Right. So, uh, more people wanting to write, and uh, and also our revenue also increase in this. Um, yeah, right. That's, that's interesting. Because the entire work from home, lockdowns, so social distancing, all of it is actually contributed to more people coming to your platform to consume content, but also the same people are now generating content. So those uh, stats that you shared were uh, very insightful. The fact that, you know, your readership has increased by 3x during this time and more people are spending time on the platform. So that's really interesting. Uh, I now come to Miss Wong. Uh, and uh, again, what have you seen specifically in Vietnam with regards to changing consumer behavior in the e-commerce um, sector? So um, Farosh is actually a platform. So we have uh, we deal with the customer, and then we do at the same time with the making like a, a boutique or a brand, a fashion retail brand. So with the we are regarding into the consumer. Uh, so we see the two change. Um, the first one is like uh, Jim said. Uh, so we saw like a significant increase into the the categories which related to, uh, which related uh, with the product at home, for example like um, sportwear or skincare or that type of product. So uh, and the second um, after we got lifted uh, for the quarantine, we see the change in the customer looking into buy a, like a cheaper product in that type. But okay. uh, for us as a, a platform, uh, we actually see the other size, which is like a supply chain and, and merchant, which is like change more significantly than the, the, the demand. Demand. So with the merchant, it's related a lot into inventory, supplying, and then all of the material back behind. So we, we see the, the kind of wave into digital transformation from our retail brand. Um, and then that the time when, when right now we're actually like focusing more on the, the inventory side and then the, the merchant side, how to uh, digital transform all of our uh, supplier and our merchant. Actually. So that is, uh, I. I see that that uh, the two changes. Uh, okay. More significant. Very interesting. Uh, I think your first point was similar to what Jean was also talking about, how the product purchase mix has now changed because in the minds of your customers, they're making that clear demarcation between what is an essential item and what is an indulgence and what is a product that they will look to purchase in the future. So that's very interesting. Uh, I now come to uh, Abhitab. Abhitab, what are some of these changes that uh, you've seen consulting for brands and what do you think are some of these short term changes and long term changes in behavior yeah first of all uh, just wanted to give you a perception um, uh, you know we are almost uh, you know servicing 5000 plus global brands across india southeast asia middle east and uh, united states now uh, and what we are observing as a bigger trend is customer uh, most of the, most of our clients wanted to know about their customer in depth so they are studying about their data they are, they are trying to figure out where what kind of data is available. And I kind of uh, second with what Dean has said. In these times, the experience matter, uh, you know, and to make the engagement metrics up and going. Uh, once you have these kind of level data, you'll be able to do that job well. And since most of these customers are using uh, automation platform, we are able to help them, uh, give them um, all the insights, and also been uh, supporting them with what are the best practices they need to follow to stay afloat in these times. Uh, to coming back to your second question, uh, rather uh, the point which you're making, Pradeep, um, what are the things what we are seeing? Um, 
one thing is customer purchases uh, uh, are now revolving mostly on the basic needs again jean has mentioned this um, uh, you know they are they are now focusing on what is the necessity item they would want to buy and not just going and doing a purchases of all the other things which they they used to do uh, sometimes back uh, and also another big behavior change what we are seeing because of these um, social distancing and they are getting isolated um, um, digital uh, connects have increased um, and they are they are also investing time in learning and also uh, they are investing time in playing i think the gaming industry uh, must have seen a great uptake uh, and i think sambit sandeep must be smiling i think the telecom industry uh, infrastructure definitely will be required in these days to support uh, the high uh, uh, usage uh, requirement coming in from um, all these uh, you know uh, users uh, and another big shift work from home is not we have seen uh, in most of the countries uh, i would say in uh, netco uh, for the last two months we have not even seen our office uh, 600 plus huge workforce is you know continuously supporting customers doing all the dev work everything is happening remotely and i think this will definitely continue even after the lockdown eases and uh, you know things you know come back um, i think these are these are some of the you know big shift um you know what i'm seeing and uh, uh, when when situation becomes normal uh, i believe uh, these things will become uh, a new norm going forward that's true that's that's very true abhitab the fact that there are some industries that have really benefited during this period you mentioned gaming there's ott there's uh, e-commerce in certain segments there's online learning and edutech so health tech as well so that's there i mean every challenge turns out to be an opportunity and uh, it depends upon how these companies and how these brands respond to that challenge uh, and the point which what we are seeing yeah. is again in in middle east and all these places where the physical buying was what we have seen uh, is a major contributor uh, uh, and uh, again uh, what genus uh, you know said that is changing people are now adopting to an online behavior and that is forcing most of the um, retailers and all these companies to also give an access to their customer uh, on their uh, digital platform so it's a huge shift and uh, these habits will will continue uh, and that's where the companies has to evolve now um, true and i think one major thing that's happened is uh, at the beginning of 2020 we really did not uh, foresee this coming we you know our marketing budgets looked so different our uh, marketing channel mix would have been different so my next question to you guys is uh, what are these key digital marketing or marketing engagement channels that are working well for you at this time and uh, do you see this channel mix continue to evolve for the remainder of 2020 and beyond jean we'll start with you um so i think for us like even like in terms of strategy right it's like we um we actually increase a fair bit our marketing spend um so we completely stop offline advertising actually earlier this year which was not linked to covid just by belief that our retail stores are already um advertising, advertising space somewhat as an omni channel company but on the online side we actually increase a fair bit and, and a lot on like customer acquisition because I think what we saw is like I think a lot of competition is a lot, was a bit scared early stage so actually they cut down their budget right which basically means that it's um a lot more a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient for for us to acquire and it's also a good time to kind of like you know increase how much you're acquiring new customer I mean to give you an idea right now we're about 3x per month the acquisition on new customers than we have where before and I think it's a lot due to like everyone stopping to acquire where we double down on it I think they've been uh, quite strong on that. After, I would say obviously Facebook remain a, a very strong channel for us. Uh, Instagram as an overall for acquisition. Uh, we've been working a lot as well on uh, CRM. They've been uh, pretty pretty good, uh, particularly around you know onboarding. How do you onboard all these new customers? Um, how do you also uh, you know incorporate messaging which shows some 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 real care? I, I think behind uh, it. um and i would say the last one we do an initiative called pomelo cares which basically um you know we we provided um mask at cost price to all our customers to buy with all the money being um given to uh, all the different hospitals across countries you know mm-hmm. to support as well and and to be honest 
I, I think people have been quite responsive because it was a time at that, at that time when it was happening, it, it was almost impossible to find any mask or, or products. So um, I think that was kind of like us doing uh, our part. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I heard countless webinars where people kind of like stop doing marketing and so forth. And, and I think it not been our strategy, our strategy being just actually, you know, it's what they say when everyone is scared, this is when you want to kind of like, you know, take over market share. And I think that's what we've been uh, focusing on. And so far, I've been paying off quite well. Um, I would say lastly, um, now we're trying to be very careful with this cohort of new customers and making sure they stay engaged, you know, as things become a new normal. So I think, like, for example, like, you know, a couple of weeks from now, we're launching our full loyalty program across platforms, you know, to make sure that these customers stay engaged in a, in a proper manner. Yeah. Uh, that's that's really interesting. The fact that you mentioned that you guys double down on customer acquisition rather than retention at this time. So uh, very, very uh, interesting thought because the go to move for any e-commerce platform in a situation like this is to cut back on their uh, spending for customer acquisition and uh, actually focus on retaining existing customers. So that's that's a really interesting insight. Um, yeah. I mean, I think on, on, on that, you know, like uh, just quickly, right? I tell you why I think it's a mistake that the company are cutting down on e-com. It's um, assuming you have enough cash, obviously, um, it's a mistake because basically, like your new customer acquisition fuel your top line revenue over time, right? And if you look at like right. maybe the fashion industry, people buy once a quarter, roughly. So if you assume everyone you acquire will fuel your top line three months from now, and 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 six months from now, and twelve months from now, and you assume like. Obviously now things are getting to a, a new normal a little bit. Actually, if you cut down, you're just gonna reduce your top line, which ultimately will make your bottom line a lot worse, you know, like uh, as you progress. So actually, you be cash, you be tighter on cash as you as you go, if you actually have a, a, a worse top line, assuming you're in a business model where scale make your unique economics better, you know, like, so that, that's one of the reasons why we've, um, Done it, and obviously we are a bit fortunate that we raised uh, a large amount of funding last September, which helps a lot during uh, COVID. Yeah, right. So essentially, your average order value per customer also sort of can uh, you, and ideally should dictate your uh, your customer acquisition costs and your retention split. So yeah, very interesting. Uh, Sandeep, what's it like being in the telecom industry? What are some of the marketing channels that are working, both from an acquisition engagement point of view? Sure. So, see, digital has digital advertising has clearly taken the center stage now in, in, in telecom. Not that it was not there earlier; it was still there, but still, uh, like uh, in, until 2019, before or, or let's say before COVID crisis, uh, there was a significant amount of spend which was going on the traditional uh, advertising, which was offline, but that has clearly shifted in favor of online. Uh, one is to advertise the existing products to the existing customers, and as as uh, as the situation demanded, the telcos have come up with fully digital products as well. And in order to take those products to the market, uh, we needed to shift a lot of our budget to uh, online channels. So we at SmartFriend uh, have, have, have brought in recently a, a, a plan called Power Plan, where the customer doesn't, uh, at his home, he will get end-to-end -end delivery of the product. The activation will be done, the same will be delivered, service will be provisioned and activated for him. So for, for, for selling this kind of product, naturally, you need to spend a lot on digital side. And this is just one example that I gave you, right? There will right. be multiple, multiple more uh, examples like this, uh, on not only on acquisition side, also on the retention side or upsell side. So clearly, the shift has, has been pretty rapid. In the last two, three months, uh, digital advertising has clearly taken center stage. Now, when it comes to the channels, naturally, uh, you name it, like Facebook, YouTube, uh, uh, then we are also moving to WhatsApp, even TikTok advertising. So these have become like the favorite channels on online space. And so far, the, what we have seen is that the take-up rate there and the customer's uh, engagement on these platforms has been pretty encouraging, right? So right. Uh, uh, because uh, so far, we haven't seen a big impact on the top line. So as a percentage of revenue, there hasn't been any significant cut in terms of the budgets. It's just that the, uh, the, channel, or, or the channel has changed a lot. In favor of digital, right? Of course, the customers, of course uh, earlier it used to be uh, targeting a segment, 
and segment was defined in a very traditional sense of it like whether it's a usage based segment or a demographic segment and that kind of stuff but now with digital taking center stage we are moving from a segment a group of customers to a customer being a segment itself so you need to contextualize it you need to personalize it and you need to understand the customer's needs before offering anything whether it's an acquisition space retention or loyalty space so this has been a this has been the general trend in the last 3 months for telco uh, clearly there is a shift but i won't say that uh, there has been any major cut as such as a percentage of problem no very interesting and actually that brings me to the the point i was building towards which is how important it is to personalize customer experiences end to end you know segmentation just done merely based on demography geolocation device type and that sort of personalization does not cut it anymore you know we live in an era where behavior driven segmentation or personalization which is one to one that's i think the way ahead and uh, you know that leads me to uh, miss olia um you know what are the marketing channels or uh, uh, you know what are the marketing channels that have been working for you and uh, do you think the channel mix will evolve for you for the rest of 2020 as well yeah um so the the moment i i saw the increase in the and acquisition uh we are actually increasing our budget and uh we create campaigns to to get people to and then they will click to to read for free at a tutorial and also we give them discount to top up uh, so uh, also a, a campaign for retention mm -hmm. um the marketing channels that working for us has been uh, social media we we use instagram story and twitter uh for us uh for what we use it for to build a particular relationship with uh, our key writers and key uh, readers uh in our platform yeah and i think um uh we we don't it's all for uh, our marketing budget goes to digital fully and uh, uh we we used to use it uh for you know like uh offline activation like book launch and everything now it's entirely online uh yeah and i think um yeah we gonna we gonna see because right now we we are looking at it uh, day by day right so we we are looking at the numbers every day and and just decide where we gonna go next yeah and and what about you know your uh, marketing automation uh, piece you know channels like email sms or uh, you know uh, mobile push notifications do they fit into your scheme of things and how are you leveraging that yeah uh, right now we are we are not optimizing that yet uh, yeah and and we are, we are we are tapping into emails but then it's not quite working for us at the moment yeah we're okay. looking at ways okay. to work more yeah okay thank you um uh, now i come to miss wong uh, what has been your marketing channel mix like and how do you see that evolving uh, for the remainder of 2020 and beyond wong you'll have to go off mute right yes so Sorry. um for 2020 uh, we actually have like reduced our marketing budget for uh, acquisition but of course uh, around 60 to 80% of us still have to spend to acquiring uh, acquire new customers um, but then it it increased uh, the we couldn't optimize the, the budget to acquire a new customer for the first two uh, two month in uh, 2020 So we actually change a little bit uh, into we optimizing our website and then uh, uh, how to have like personalized and and recommendation um, to increase because we we see the the change in into uh, when we increase the marketing budget our conversion rate on the website like it de decrease quite significantly. So we think that okay, uh, we need to optimize in our our own uh, system and website first. So that uh, what um, strategy we're doing for the next uh, three to six months. Uh, okay. But still, like all of the e-commerce, we're still uh, working with like like page channel and 
and we're doing uh, quite good in CIM because of course the question is like really uh, CIM is a very good channel for question uh, but we, yeah Okay, interesting. So it's actually very important to understand customer behavior, how they are interacting across different marketing channels as well. Are they responding better on email? Are they responding better to mobile push notifications? So those become very critical aspects to consider. And I think Abhidab will also have some insights on this. So Abhidab, the mic's all yours. Yeah, I think I, I, I second what Sandeep is saying. Um, the digital um, uh, is on the stage of it. Um, there are two kinds of behavior what we are seeing. Um, the kind of vertical which is highly impacted like travel and all, um, or rather the deal sites, these kind of companies where the top line has really gone down to 80, 90 percentage, they have kind of stopped everything uh, in terms of marketing and wait and watching uh, how the business will uh, you know, uh, take up in the coming few months. But on the other side, uh, the other vertical is like, you know, wallet companies and telecoms and uh, e-commerce, they, they have increased their spend on the digital side of it, um, and very little they used to have on the ATM digital side of it, but mostly the digital is what they are trying out in various ways, how they can get acquisition, and we are also seeing that customers are investing their budget in retention um, uh, also, and also in engagement. Uh, they don't want to lose their customer. As Gene said, uh, you know, when they are focusing on acquiring uh, customers, those customers will be ideally will be serviced by some of their competitors. Um, so if they don't focus on retaining their customer, then I believe they will lose out. So which kind of the behavior is what we have seen across the globe. Um, investments are, are getting pumped into acquisition, engagement, and retention, uh, depending upon verticals, their business priorities, the percentage might differ. Uh, and uh, especially for Netcode, we have increased our spending on um, the digital side of it. Um, and these days, opportunities are not available, at least for the coming few months, in terms of spending uh, on the offline uh, activities. So that's that's kind of uh, increase from uh, you know our side of uh, uh, it. And I like the statement what Gina said. Uh, you know, when when the um, you know uh, everybody is scared about uh, putting their money and expanding it, this is the time to speed the market. I go with uh, what he's saying, and especially when. The company like Netco, we we are profitable and uh, we are growing strong. We don't have external investors uh, to put a stop on our expansion plans. So we are going aggressive in terms of recruiting people and expanding, uh, putting our money uh, um, uh, in terms of getting new acquisition things like that. In the U.S., um, while there are like 40 million um, jobs have been taken away by the COVID, uh, we have uh, hired uh, the new new CRO. And also, we have uh, recruited a couple of senior folks, and our expansion in US is going big way. Uh, and this is what, uh, in the two sides of the scenario, there are opportunities available and there are challenges. Uh, look at the opportunities and uh, take a big leap. Uh, and uh, that's what will take you to the next level when these situations get settled a few months from now. Yeah, interesting insight um, from all of you, actually. And one thing that I wanted to add, and that I have seen in my conversations with a lot of brands, is that. WhatsApp has emerged as a major marketing channel now. Not just, you know, it's not for promotional marketing, it's transactional messaging and for customer support and service. So, uh, you know, in a lot of our conversations with brands, especially for those companies that cannot or do not have the manpower bandwidth to contribute to their customer support through call centers, etc., WhatsApp has now emerged as a two-way conversational, uh, you know, platform where customers can address their grievances, they can, uh, you know, get their uh, queries resolved. So that's another marketing channel that I feel has really uh, come up during this time. Um, you know, the key I think takeaway from this uh, in this question was how customer acquisition is equally important. You know, just by saying that retention is the new acquisition, it's not enough, but you need to think out of the box as well. So. Thank you so much for those insights. And uh, I think Wong mentioned briefly on how important it is to you know, work on personalization across your website or mobile app. And that leads me to my next question. You know, they say that uh, personalizing customer experiences at scale is a sure short way to ensure both customer engagement and retention at scale. How does your brand view, personal, view personalization as a game changer across your website, mobile app, or marketing campaigns. 
what does essentially personalization mean to you we'll start with gene um yeah so i think we we've been working on a lot of projects uh, particularly the last couple of months on, on personalization some through third parties with um, amazon personalized for uh, product personalizations uh, some through you know our own like uh, belief on how to personalize it i think some people try to go like very very advanced when it comes to personalization to go like you know ai driven and, and whatnot but i think ultimately for 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 fashion you know i think there are plenty of tools i mean like i said like amazon personalize is a very good one just because you can imagine how strong is amazon at personalizing um you know that are out there which are like cost effective um and basically can drive like good result um so i think like in general like the second part, right, of personalization we try to do at Pomelo is mm -hmm. that we're trying to be a bit more community-based type of company. So we try to get like real-time feedback from customers in order to feed them the product that they want, right? Whether it is through, you know, Instagram polls on like, you know, do you want to buy this or that, you know, whether it's um, by email, by asking them directly and so forth. So I, I think having a mix of data-driven personalization and then real-time customer feedback is, um, actually the key to success because I think if you only have data driven, sometimes it has its own uh, flaws as well. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and we're doing it not just for online, right? So actually all our stores, the inventory in each stores is personalized to the location of the stores, depending on, you know, income level, type of customers, age, you know, profiling and so forth. So even our stores, if you go to, you know, different Pomelo stores, um, they're all done through um, data when it comes to merchandising and it's all done um, on an individual case basis when it comes to that. So we kind of like bridge a little bit better the offline world with the online data that we collected in order to build uh, an ideal customer experience. And then lastly, because you're a fashion company, you still need to make sure that everything looks good, you know? Like, uh, you know, people, if you just do everything through data, it, it can look pretty pretty weird at some point. So I think we want to make sure that everything looks um, uh, aesthetically uh, correct, you know, like uh, whether it's offline or, or online. So, you know, different components to, to make it work well, uh, but that's kind of like the, the way we've been uh, approaching it, you know, in, uh, in, in general. Right, interesting because we at Netcore also work with a lot of e-commerce, uh, you know, brands across the globe, and we've seen how important it is to not just think of product recommendations as you know sending them recommendations best based on trending items or best sellers. You know, you it's a tightrope walk. You got to look at your merchandising rules. You got to look at managing your inventory. You got to look at providing them a seamless experience between both offline and online. Because at the end of the day, once you have a unified view of every customer, that helps you personalize the experience far better. And uh, the point that you made about not just rely, relying on data-driven personalization alone was extremely interesting. Because at the end of the day, you also need that human intervention to kick in and make those appropriate calls. Because not every time will the AI engine get you the, uh, you know, the relevant and contextual recommendation. So very, very apt points there. Uh, Oh, we have another guest who has just come in. We also have Yuda Viravan, CMO of Jagadiri, one of the biggest uh, uh, companies in the insurance sector from Indonesia. Yuda, if you can hear us, it'd be great if you could say hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I believe that uh, it has taken a little bit of effort for you to get here, but you have joined us. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry for this one. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I think we're all gl glad to have you here. Everybody just saying a big warm welcome from wherever you are to Yuda. Thank, thank you. Yuda. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for right. <laughs> no problem. Better better late than never. You know what they say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, Yuda, just for context, we're talking about what personalization means to your brand and company. So uh, Gene just shared his thoughts. I'm going to come to you shortly. Uh, Sandeep, what does it look like? Oh, I I spoke too soon. Sandeep, what does it look like uh, when it comes to personalization for uh, your particular brand and industry? Yes. So personalization for uh, tel telcos has always been uh, a hot topic. And uh, through the CLM, right. Customer Lifetime 
management and also see uh, they they've been trying to contextualize the offerings but more on the telco space and using their traditional channels such as sms or emails right, right? uh so definitely in in telco space the contextualization or personalization starts from knowing the customer end to end and that's something we call as customer 360 right so the experience of buying the experience of using the experience of um, you know interacting with the call center or interacting with the website you know, cho- uh, choosing the product you know choosing the top ups and the data packs all that goes into the into the learning engine and that's where basically a customer profile ai ml driven customer profile is created which becomes the bedrock of personalization on top of that bedrock you have something a, a, a omni channel tool basically which which allows the market yes to take whichever channel they suit uh, they think are, is suitable for their their customers depending on uh, depending on the response rate it can be sms it can be app notification it can be emails it can be even as you mentioned whatsapp is coming at coming as a big channel now so that is on the channel side of things and then uh, once the delivery happens closing the loop in terms of the take up and in terms of the customer experience because in telco uh, we, we we need to uh, train our uh, model so that you know the next delivery or the next personalization experience which the customer is going to get from the telco is more relevant for him so this is basically uh, has been a strong hold for telcos traditionally but with the covid kind of a situation where uh, the customers are not coming to the or coming less to the stores uh, this becomes a lot more challenging and on this space a lot of work has been done even in smart friend which is my company we have we have done a lot of work in last 3 to 4 months and uh, as i was telling earlier that there is a digital only product power plan which we have launched recently uh, same like that we have started whatsapp chatbot where a customer can do end to end uh inquiry handling or a purchase of a product or you know uh, purchase of a top up or a or a, or a data pack all through whatsapp and you know indonesia being a very digitally connected society uh and where whatsapp is uh, pretty deeply penetrated that channel is coming uh, as a as a favorite of a lot of our customers and uh, we have also started using tiktok for that for some of our communication some of our promotions but so far we haven't uh, matured on that but whatsapp of late has been one of our great success stories here a yeah, very 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 interesting you know you mentioned how it's important to have a 360 degree unified customer view which becomes your bedrock to actually drive omni channel personalization and i think another key point that you touched upon is how it's important to personalize across all digital touch points you know you, do, you don't just look at your website your mobile app you look at every single marketing channel and all of that data essentially feeds back and makes your ai ml engine at the back end far more intuitive you know reinforced learning is a key aspect of any personalization engine that you're driving so thank you so much for sharing that uh, i now come to olia how does storyal view personalization yeah uh, for us uh, as we just get uh, a lot of new readers coming in and we realize that uh, hyper personalization is home because uh, a lot of readers like to Indonesian people lo- lo- like to read but we just need to know what do they like to read right which which category right if they like novels they will go deep into it you know like korean novel for example and and we just need to know what is it you know data with with data and also give them more of the contents that they want give give them the writers that they want to read and so it's super important uh we we see uh, like we work together with partners uh, to distribute our content like line today for example and uh when we acquire new new user from from this uh partnership we see high conversion rate in terms of acquisition and retention also monetization uh so yeah so definitely uh it's something that is uh, uh we we need to explore more and very important for our uh, users Uh, that's insightful because you know a lot of e-commerce brands they they talk about product recommendations alone when it comes to personalization but it's so important for media news publishing companies also to actively look at content recommendations because yeah. that's getting get, you know getting them those hyper personalized recommendations will ensure that they spend more time on your platform they're consuming more content you know your bounce rates continue to go down 
um, you know, your ad revenues can increase. So yeah. a variety of different benefits that it can provide to you. So yeah, thank because, you. Because people is uh, really have their comfortable uh, readings uh, material, right? So they right. they will explore more into their what they're comfortable reading, but then they they can expand uh, as our recommendation, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, that brings me now to Yudha, uh, his uh, first question of the panel discussion. Yudha, how does uh, Jagadiri view uh, personalization and um, you know this entire concept of using recommendations as a conversion catalyst? Well, all right. Well, uh, Jagadiri, since 2015, uh, when we start launch the campaign as the first digital insurance in Indonesia, so we already committed that the company is built on data-driven analytics actions where personalized customer experience is going to be key. So uh, we've been able to identify the waterfall on every customer journey of the customers, on every journey of the customers. How can we or we be able to create relevant and contextual actions based on customer's behavior and building personalized content throughout? whether through the digital, since we are uh, building the companies uh, through a direct and digital marketing channels. So we have all the data, we have all the information required to be able to set contextual actions and relevant actions through each of the customers. So for example, if customers uh, go to our website and, and they're just uh, not, not staying long in the website, then we'll be able to set relevant context to them, what kind of information required for them, so for them to go back to our website. And finally, they're going to uh, have another another, another genie which is going to buy the, uh, the buy the insurance. So I think we are, you are quite, uh, quite uh, I might say we are quite uh, pleased that we are uh, the, one of the companies that is built on digitalizations, personalizations with, uh, through the uh, data-driven uh, uh, companies' action. So I think Again, I think uh, data is became, becoming very key for us to be able to set relevant and context, uh, contextual information to the, to the right customers or to the right audience. Right. And I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Jagadiri is also the first uh, player in the insurance sector in Indonesia who's, you know, leveraged WhatsApp business API. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, another. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I believe, uh, uh, as I mentioned to you, that I think. Uh, Data-driven marketing channels are the most powerful channels uh, for, for us uh, as well as in the future because when we're able to identify, analyze, model the metrics available for us to be more effective and efficient as a sales channels or as a marketing channels. Well, with approximately about 142 million Indonesian consumers using WhatsApp, so I think that will be more, one of the most powerful tools. And it is not just going to be a single, a, a single push a context a communication that we are trying to build. It's more engaging to the consumers where the consumers can directly uh, inform us on what they're required. And in time, we are going to build as well the automation tools and the CRM tools in place uh, for the customers to be engaged us uh, to be engaging, to be more engaging with us uh, in more uh, in more relevant as well in more uh, convenient way. No, very true. Very interesting insights there. Thank you, Yuda. Uh, I now come to Miss Huang. What does personalization mean to Ferosh and uh, how are you guys going about uh, taking that journey? So, with, uh, so personalization is like the, the word you always heard when you do the e-commerce and that type but then it, it kind of like a fancy word for us that until uh, like 2020. So we started like um, doing a little bit more on the recommendation. Uh, before that, we're trying to do more on the complete outfit. So that's more of the image um, and uh, have like analyzing. Um, uh, but then that one is actually didn't cut out. So we, we work more on the recommendation. Uh, and then we currently have like two projects, but then the uh, majority first one of that is collect data, and then the second one is optimize it. And then this action it is it, a very trendy, and it based on a lot of inventory, and it based a lot on weather, and then uh, the whole mix of data is like we we still in the top and trying to figure out one like one step, one step by step. 
Correct. Now, you know, the, the one, one point that came out is essentially uh, the more data that you have on every customer, the better positioned you are are to you know like drive those personalized experiences so you know while you can provide recommendations on the entire outfit you can uh, provide uh, you know cross sell or upselling uh, products that are more most relevant to every customer you can personalize your website based on the season or the weather or even geolocation for that matter so there's so much that you can do and uh, yeah it's interesting to note how feroce is going about it uh, that actually brings me to uh, abitab um, your thoughts on how b2c brands are leveraging personalization um see, uh, uh, what we have seen as an uptake uh, all across wherever we are present uh, whether it is middle east africa uh, india uh, southeast asia uh, or europe um email and app push notification with a personalized message with relevant content and also a product recommendations are really working well uh this is encouraging customers to return back to the website um, and through mobile apps and uh, stay touch with a lot of things what brand is want to do in terms of engagement in terms of uh, making uh, all those transactions and especially what we have seen a big trend happening is uh, on the e-commerce side otd platform uh, edutech and um, you know fintech uh, verticals you know great uh, activities are happening Uh, and, and for that, they need to capture a lot of insights about the customer. Um, and as Rudra said, and also as Sandeep said, you know, data has to be captured um, uh, if they would want to do such kind of a deep personalization. Um, and also, I think um, uh, what what others have so, spoken about WhatsApp. That's an again an emerging channel. What we have seen, uh, especially Facebook is taking a lot of interest. Uh, and and uh, in India itself, they have taken a, a good percentage of stake in one of the largest telecom. uh whatsapp commerce is coming in a big way uh, in southeast asia we have seen a lot of brands are adopting to whatsapp commerce uh, we have seen a lot many requests coming in that manner a uh, lot of customers are using whatsapp as a channel for you know support engagement and servicing uh, whatsapp plus chatbot is again a new trend um, a lot of customers are um, you know adopting it i think that channel is also a kind of um, you know um, uh, seeing as a new trend uh, in terms of communication so this is what my view for this uh, uh that's that's really interesting and uh, yeah actually given the fact that you know every brand needs to figure out what works best for them even in e-commerce you have brands that are selling cosmetics you have uh, fast fashion you have uh, you know luxury items you need to figure out what personalization strategy works best for you across all digital touch points and i think that will be a key to towards regrowth uh, not just in southeast asia but in other uh, mature and emerging markets as well uh so that actually brings me to my next question you know there is so much talk about how ai and ml is going to play a starring role in the future of digital and mobile marketing i wanted your thoughts on how you think this is going to reshape the entire digital and mobile marketing environment uh, whether it is through predictive analytics whether it is through you know app churn prediction app uninstall prediction etc uh, your thoughts on how it is relevant to your industry and uh, your company we'll start with jean um i think like there is a few things right like of course like it will change like uh, the industry and it's probably the future i think there's no um, question about that um however um you know i think today 90% of the company out there don't even do the basics right so i think like before going into ai predictive you know analysis and so forth i, I think it's very important to cover the basics you know first you know like AI is just, you know, generally very great when you kind of like already structure all your data correctly. You know, like if your data is not structured correctly, there's so much AI uh, can, can do on top of it. Um, so I think like we hear a lot out there, a lot of companies talking about it, but I, I do think that again, like there are a lot of solutions which are like pretty low cost that they can actually implement in order to improve their businesses. Um, I would say as I said earlier I think when it comes to product recommendation obviously AI you know can be applicable to uh, any e-commerce company out there so I think on the aspect it's um, you know it's probably a, a good thing 
I think it can be very useful for the fashion industry in terms of like uh, trends. So like using AI to kind of like understand what are the next trend out there, um, you know, ahead of, of the competition. I think on, on that regard, I think can definitely be used um, uh, pretty well. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, if I look at us, like, you know, we started to like bring more, you know, data scientists and, and so forth in to, in order to, to build like uh, these kind of solutions. But I think in the meantime, we're focusing on like getting all the basics right in order to like, you know, prepare for, for the future and bring, you know, any type of like uh, AI solution on, on, on board. Um, I would say the only part where right now we're using it, I say probably recommendation, we, we, we're getting to that. And then on the CRM side, um, there is certain aspect that is uh, done through AI as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's the future, but do the basics right. I think it's uh, very, very key. I think there's too many companies out there that just like spend so much time on these projects when they could spend, you know, better time just fixing, you know, some of their core issues, you know. True, true, very true. Because your AI and ML engine or layer is only as effective as the quality of customer data that you're collecting. So there's no point jumping into those complex aspects if you don't get your fundamentals right. Valuable point there, uh, Gene. Uh, yeah, Sandeep, on Excel spreadsheet, like uh, definitely you should, uh, you know, like that's what I'm saying. It's like. There are companies that are still like using spreadsheet to like kind of like structure the data. I think once you're there, you're a long way from AI. You know? Correct. Very true. Get your house in order before you're looking to build the mansion. Sandeep, your thoughts on uh, the future of digital and mobile marketing and the uh, increased application of ML AI? So I think what Gene also said, AI ML is, 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 a, is a much talked about topic these days, especially when it comes to the, con when the context is digital digitalization right or digital experience of course my uh, my takeaway of uh, last few years of working with telcos has has been that aiml is a means to an end you cannot see it uh, as an end of any 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 anything so it has to serve a purpose so there has to be a customer statement which needs to be served by aiml be it on acquisition side retention side so you need to have a business issue and aiml will go, go on to solve that issue now since it cut, cuts across all the facets of the business whether it is uh, whether it is a call center related matter or it's a gallery or it's a onboarding or it's a, you know product communication AI and ML is going to come into all the facets of business. That goes without saying because the companies are moving more and more uh, towards the data driven decisions, right? And right. Uh, and in, in, specifically in a telco where people are using a lot of internet these days, the data is building up and not many telcos have the expertise of using that data to the advantage of the customers. So like in SmartFriend, we have, uh, and that's where my unit sits, that we are also trying to uh, develop this engine where basically we can cross leverage the data from, from one touch point to the other touch point and offer a holistic experience to the customer, right? So, um, and I think another point that Gene was making is very correct, that a lot of companies, they do not have layer one, which I call as the basic data, basic customer data. And if you have garbage inside, you'll only get garbage with whatever AI ML you apply, right? True. So uh, it's very it's, it's a mandatory thing to have your raw data very clean, as clean as you can, and then apply AI ML. Less AI ML on a good data will give you good results rather than doing a lot of stuff on AI ML data when True. you know that the data itself is not very clean. But uh, but in, in general, going forward, AI ML is here to stay. And uh, since the companies are moving more and more digital, any recommendation or predictive analytics or forecast, they will all be driven by AI ML. And better a company is in this space, I think the better will be the take up, better will be the customer experience and better will be the results of that company. True, very true. Uh, I'll now quickly move to uh, Aulia, your take on the application of AI ML on the future of marketing. Okay, uh, probably I'm just going to go straight directly to the application uh, for my own business, yeah. So sure. basically, uh, essentially Storyel is an IP business, intellectual property, right? So uh, we have right now 50,000 titles of stories uh, and books in our platform. And we would really want to recognize and identify the bestseller, you know, like the, the good ones, the high quality uh, stories, uh, 
immediately. Um, right now, uh, our, our efforts are heavily uh, manual, like we have our own editors and everything. So we would like, uh, of course, with the help of you know um, machine learning, AI, to to be able to automate that process and of course make it faster for us. Yeah. So that's that's okay. uh, that's the way I look at it. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, what about you, Yuda? All right. So I think uh, uh, Yin is is making the right the right uh, the right comment. But first of all, I would like to highlight on the insurance industry. So I think uh, in in a very long term uh, manner that the insurance industry, in order for them for them to grow the the sales number or to grow the the, the volume numbers, is by acquiring as more sales people as possible, acquire more agents as possible for you to be able to grow your uh, your businesses, and doing through traditional model. So it means like acquire more agents, acquire more uh, uh, acquire more agents field agents and uh, by, by then then you get uh, you get more sales and you get more growth on today's age especially uh, after the covid impact and since indonesia is pretty known that the the, the, the insurance industry is 82.5% are still going through traditional channels they have to rethink i think the the, the future will be those company who can create sustainable effective efficient business impact will be more more, more sustained comparing those, uh, those those companies or those uh, uh, the, uh yeah those companies who is uh, who is having still uh, the the mindset that by acquiring more agents they get more more sales how to do that means that you have to harvest your data you have to harvest your information so you'll be able to get the right custom uh, the right consumers at the right time through the right channels because otherwise you will be just wasting money you'll be just uh, pouring money means that you uh, you get more sales uh, none, not in an effective way you could get sales you could get more sales but it's not going to be effective so i think um, more importantly uh, as jen mentioned uh, that that uh, is those company are those companies who can harvest the data more and get the, the data structured uh, pretty pretty well then you can go to the next level by doing that you'll be able to create more effective and efficient uh, long-term uh, business model comparing to to whatever the traditional one so so it's not yet going to the of course the future will be more machine learning predictive analytics where uh, where the companies will be able to make decisions based on the based on the direct uh, data information or based on the real-time data information but as mentioned i think uh, there are so many companies right now especially on insurance industry not yet being able to think on how can i move uh, from 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 the traditional model channels which is face to face business into more uh, digital uh, customer experience online and uh, beyond face to face model so how can you create full marketing in terms of push model so i think th those are the challenges especially in the insurance industry and uh, and i think the those that will be surviving are those companies who's really been able to harvest the data and make the data be structured and so we'll be able to see which channels works for which customers and as well uh, on, uh, on 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 what time. So I think I think that's uh, my key takeaway on this one. Nice. That's that's really insightful. Uh, dialing back into uh, e-commerce and you know how AI ML is going to impact uh, this particular segment, uh, Ms. Wong, your thoughts on this? So, as I said before, um, there are is a platform. So we have a customer size and we have a merchant size, which is like boutique and retailer. So um, uh, when go boutique and retailer, we have the whole supply chain system. And then the AI is like um, a very, so when you go into the supply chain when of uh, tracking, you see that um, it, if we not have for like a big retailer in Vietnam, so majority of, of small and boutique retailers in Vietnam, um, they doesn't use data or anything to, to uh, manufacture the next season of the product. So that is uh, our thought when, when we come to think of AI. So how we predict the next trend in there, and then we input the data back to the supply chain, um, and then we create that that one. So so. Um, we really thought of AI uh, and then include it into the supply chain more than uh, 
um, the, the, the consumer and then customer, right? So that is, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, finally, Abhitab, your take on this. Um, AI will play uh, a big role um, uh, in, uh, in the coming days um, from the customer and the behavioral data. Uh, the bank has to you know, capture all those things uh, in light. I kind of agree with uh, Sandeep on that. Uh, and also uh, the point Jean mentioned, you need to have the house in order um, to have all these things. Um, you know, what I've seen is you know, we have two personalization, uh, aggressive uh, and, you know, uh, uptake happening with all the customers who are, uh, you know, um, using a product. One is on the email side of it, the send time optimization, the subject life optimization, uh, and all the other churn predictions and things are happening. Uh, and they are, get, they are getting engagement, they're getting response. Uh, you know, this channel is really helping them um, to get that kind of an open rate, click rate, uh, and working fantastic for them. Um, so uh, AI is playing a big role over there. Over and above that, uh, you know, another product which is creating a wave uh, uh, is our personalization product coupled with our AI combo. Uh, and especially um, for the fashion vertical, a um, lot, of, lot of good uh, responses are coming in. The customers who have already uh, used this product have seen uh, the customer engagement, acquisitions, the, um, the percentage of ROI uh, has gone in terms of ATEX kind of multiples. Uh, and this is, this is Basically, because they having having this data, they having insights coupled with our AI engine, we are able to exactly predict what's the next customer move uh, and showcase to them and make their transactions, make their decisions a little bit easier. So uh, uh, we have seen these kind of uh, big shift um, in, in in the customers whom already you know we are servicing. And my personal take is uh, this is the way forward, and more and more customers. Um, will adopt this. Uh, no one can skip it. It can be a little bit of delay because of their preparedness and things like that. But uh, uh, they they will have to get adopted to it. And uh, as a company, we are we are quite strong in this area, and uh, we are seeing adoption. We are seeing more and more customers are getting engaged with us, and we are helping and uh, to achieve their goal. Uh, uh, so we are here. So personally, my my take is this will be a next big wave. Right. And I think one major key takeaway that has come from this particular question is that AI ML is as good as the quality and the quantity of the customer data that you collect. You know, if you look at the data flywheel, you have data, then you have insights, then you have intelligence and then you have action. You know, it's a constant flywheel that's in motion and you add a layer of AI ML only once you have this basic foundation and machinery in place. That's when you can truly leverage and benefit from the power of AI and ML. And I think uh, that's been the key takeaway from this particular question. So we've talked about a lot of heavy things, a lot of great insights that have come out. We've spoken about you know changing consumer behavior trends and how you guys believe it's gonna be for the short term or for the long term. Uh, we've spoken about how you need to strike the right balance between customer acquisition and retention and sometimes flip the narrative as Gene said, you know, when your competition is scared, when your competitors are scared, you might as well go after the entire uh, market that you can uh, chase. Uh, we talked about how marketing spends and channel mixes are evolving depending upon regions and industries. And we spoke about the key importance of personalization and AI involved and all of this being based on the bedrock of solid customer data, which is geographic, demographic and behavioral in nature to make those right predictions. So I thought I'm going to lighten the mood a little bit. I'm going to ask you uh, a series of quick questions. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds. Um, and uh, I actually have a timer in place. So, you know, there you go. So you'll have 30 seconds, each of you. And my questions will be slightly more lighthearted, but it will also give us, uh, give our audience something to think about. So are you guys ready? Ready. Yeah. All right, awesome. So we're going to go in the same order. My first question to you is, one thing that you believe digital brands should focus on while pursuing regrowth right now. Gene. Say again. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. Say again. Uh -oh. <laughs> we have a misfire. You have to stop right. it. Tina. Yes, yes. Stop, stop. And reset. Okay. My first question is your advice 
to CMOs and CTOs right now who are trying to chart out their uh, you know their first action step towards regrowth. Um, I would say like the same thing. Like focus on the process. Don't focus on like the uh, out. You know the outcome. I think that whatever input you, you you put now is more important. And I think that's been the mistake of a lot of companies trying to achieve that target as opposed to like focus on the process and doing the right thing. So that's kind of like my key takeaway. Okay. Awesome. Sandeep. Yep. So keep keep customer at the center of all your decisions. Uh, keep his customer experience and customer journey in mind in whatever decisions you're making, whether it's AI driven or personalization or data driven decisions. Customer is the one who's going to tell you that what basically we demand and all this a digital uh, digital transformation which the companies are working towards at the end is going to meet customer what what is demanding actually so don't do not do not lose what your customer demands bang on time huh? 28 seconds good job I, I have a timer before me as well <laughs> <laughs> all right olia you're up next yeah basically to look at data to really understand what our users need Talk to them too. You know, you you can do it through social media and every all channels that you can. So it can translate to the best initiatives to uh, optimize uh, their users, uh, the users' experience. That's awesome! <laughs> awesome! Everyone's wary of the timer now. It's Wong. Your thirty seconds start now. I think it's, um, first it's, it's focus on the the number, trying to set the right tracking data and then you can actually trust with the company so um, right now we're in the processing of uh, of like right tracking with the number okay awesome abitab i'm going to come to you now okay focus on getting your customer data right and actually uh, i think this becomes the foundation for better segmentation you know, targeting and engagement um, I could see a smile on Sandeep's face. He's the data guy, uh, big data guy. Uh, anything which is related to that is fiddling around with it, and and, and that's that's something which will help companies to you know really uh, achieve the next goal. Uh, you know, data will be the king, and after that comes all the other things. All right, awesome. Yuda, can you hear us? No. Yudha, perhaps you could send in your message through chat. We'll have to make this multi-channel panel discussion now. <laughs> all right. Um, one final question to all of you guys. Um, and I'm sure you as thought leaders, as business leaders, you've been consuming a lot of content during this time. So one helpful book or a series of blog podcasts or any content that you have consumed during this time that you would recommend to fellow marketing tech practitioners or founders in the industry. We start um, with you. Actually, I reread. I already read it, but I reread uh, a book called um, "The Scores Takes Care of Itself," um, which is written by Bill Walsh, which is um, was uh, you know the most successful coach of um, 49ers, the NFL team. And I think the reason behind was like, you know, you're just as good as your people. So I think like um, resetting some basics in terms of leadership is definitely necessary during this time, particularly when people are working from home or different location and, and try to be a, a better leader. So that's my take. Awesome. OK, uh, we come to Sandeep. So one of the recent briefs I had was this AI advantage from Thomas Devonport. Uh, this is a good book actually it, it, it gives the the ai from more from a marketer's perspective uh, focusing more on the use cases rather than the technology aspect of it but mostly when people talk about ai or ml the 80 percent focus goes towards the technology part of it so it's very important for us marketers to uh, to to stay close to what uh, what business wants and what customer wants and see the business side of ai from that perspective i think it's a good book so you might like to read that awesome i've already made note of that Thomas Davenport. All right, Olya, you're up next. Okay, I have two book recommendations. 
One is for uh, our yeah, Just on, on a lighter note, I'm guessing there would be so many books on your platform alone. <laughs> yeah. So I, I recommend a book uh, by Marcus Aurelius called Meditations. It's a stoic book. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good for our mental health right now. And then um, also it's by Nir Eyal. So basically it's uh, nice. helping uh, to create habit, you know, uh, for our app. Yeah. Nice. Nice. All right. I'm guessing Yuda will have to type in his response again. Uh, we come to Miss Wong. Um, so one of the books I'm, I'm reading actually um, during this time is um, what we call Skin in the Game. Skin in the Game by uh, Nicholas uh, Nassim Talib. Exactly. So the key taking during this time is uh, how to make decisions. And then I, I think one of the things I'm, I really love in there is uh, only the one who have played. They make it so clear that um, who should make decisions during this. Um, so that's one of the, the, yeah. Awesome. So Yuda has uh, put in his uh, multi-channel response here. He says that he reads most uh, autobiography books to you uh, by Steve Jobs, Alex Ferguson, Richard Branson, and Jack Ma. That's a lot of reading done during this period. So good on you, Yuda. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, Abhitab, what would you recommend? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, um, there's a book of John Doerr, uh, Measure What Matters. Uh, this is uh, basically to get your OKRs right, uh, deep insights, and how to get your objectives and key results. Um, uh, great companies like Intel and uh, uh, you know Fortune 500 have implemented it, and we have already uh, started uh, implementing this entire objective and key results in our organizations right from top to the, the bottom. Uh, we are seeing some great changes uh, happening to achieve our uh, key objective this financial year. So, uh, guys, if you really want to stay focused on getting your goals right, I think this helps uh, definitely a much for um, a all right. One thing we've established is that all of you guys are very well read and you know how to stick to time limits. Okay, interesting. Oh, Yudha's here. Yudha, you are audible again. So uh, if you would like to fill in uh, on, yeah, your advice to CMOs or CTOs to get started on the regrowth path. Sorry, so you can hear me now? Yes, yes, Yudha. You seem okay, very surprised. <laughs> No, I think right. So I think uh, all the, all this conversation is about uh, understanding more on your consumers, uh, whatever the the industry is, whether it's you're coming from insurance, whether coming from telco, whether coming from e-commerce, is, is to be able to understand about your segment better, and being able to to give relevant relevant context to to those consumers. Well, basically, it's just what or what Sandeep mentioned uh, as well is about. Uh, put your customers at, at the center of everything that you do. That is going to be very key, so I think, for all the industry, from whatever the industry that you're coming from. I think that's very really key. True. And that actually brings us to the close of our first panel discussion. I just wanted to summarize some very key solid insights that have come out from this discussion. Uh, you know, we spoke about how you need to strike the right balance between customer acquisition and retention. Uh, we spoke about how consumer behavior trends um, you know, are evolving, not just because they may or may not have the purchasing power in their hands, but because in their minds, they are prioritizing what is an essential, what is an indulgence, what is a luxury. So based on that, their perceptions are changing, their consumption and purchase patterns are evolving. Um, we spoke about how you know, to get personalization right, to get your AI ML engine to kick in, your customer data has to be right, unified, enriched, and real time. So once you have that in place, that allows you to do so much more with all the customer data that you collect. Um, so yes, that actually brings us to the close. Thank you so much to each one of you for taking out the time and being a part of this uh, super insightful panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for uh, organizing Thank as you. well, uh, Nekor. No, I'm glad you the could finally join. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, for our audience, please stay tuned. Our next panel discussion will be starting very, very soon. It's going to focus on another aspect of business altogether. So stick around. There's a lot more to come. All right.
Bye. Right. Thank, you. thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, thank you so much okay. for the questions. Uh, at times like this is when I, I I regret not being in person over there having this event physically. So uh, so for for the crowd here, thank you guys for waiting. Uh, some tiny technical glitch over here. We we'll overcome that, and the show is going on. Now uh, let me let me uh, introduce you to my most patient panel. Uh, I, I, I will start with uh, pa Daniel over here. Uh, pa Daniel is the CEO of Vision Plus. It is an OTT brand of MNC Vision Network. He's also the managing director of M MVN. Uh, he's in charge of ad sales and in-house channel programming and production. He's also the CEO of OKZone, the, the leading news and lifestyle portal as well. Secondly, we have Pa Sofian Lusa over here from Akupinta. Pa Sofian Lusa has spent more than 16 years uh, as an IT consultant, as a practitioner, and as an academic. His formal education background is of a graduate in the doctoral program in the University of Indonesia. He's also very actively involved with various associates, associations such as uh, the Indonesian E-Commerce Association, Mastel, and the E-Government Laboratory at Fasil University in Indonesia. We have Park Kelvin. Park Kelvin uh, has been in the world of tech since 2008. He started off as a PHP programmer and a Cisco associate, and now he's climbed, climbed his way up uh, to lead Gramedia. And we have Pasaket, who is our chief revenue officer for the emerging markets at Netcore. Uh, he's played a pivotal, pivotal role in the global expansion for Netcore. Uh, he's one of those people who is who is applauded for for the effort effort he's put in and putting flags across country. Um, he carries an in-depth experience in the Martech space, analytics, AI, and ML. Yeah, the panel international and Now, uh, uh, so uh, Daniel, so quickly starting with our question number one. Now, the COVID crisis, yes, it has come, it has hit us. Uh, now, we need to look forward. Uh, the one thing that people are talking about is, uh, yes, it has come, it's shaken the foundation of business itself. So many businesses, uh, so, many, so many companies are going out of business. So many startups are are firing, um, and and the manufacturing. Now, Japan as a country is known for its pandemic-proof homes. Now, how do we start looking for a uh, for our pandemic-proof homes? So, Pa uh, Daniel, what do we do about uh, our pandemic-proof businesses? How do we go about this? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, when I follow the uh, session one uh, topic, which is uh, talking about the change of the consumer behavior i think this is uh, very much uh, related to the discussion here uh, first of all i think we need to understand uh, what has changed uh, during the pandemic the behavior of the consumer so uh, we at msc group of course we have to uh, realign our businesses especially being uh, dominantly is a media company so uh, we need to know what has changed so for example that uh, most of the most of our audience now uh, they uh, you know they are in lock that lockdown situation so whether uh, they work from home or stay stay from home or probably you know uh, there has been a change of jobs uh, and other things so basically they can't move around and uh, the uh, activities outside of their home is very limited so uh, this of course changed uh, how they uh, you know enjoy uh, media and information as well as entertainment so uh, building that meaning that uh, building a you know a pandemic proof or fireproof homes that uh, we MNC group uh, we change also number one which is our strength is our content yeah our content is our strength so the content that we produce now uh, basically is geared toward the uh, needs of uh, the change of, I mean, the, the change of the social behavior. Yeah. So, for example, uh, basically, we need to create uh, contents that make people uh, feel more enjoyable at home. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the travel related uh, contents, for example, of course, we limit it yeah, because it's not uh, relevant anymore at this, mm -hmm. this kind of situation. But, uh, Culinary, for example, that's uh, something that a uh, lot of uh, female now suddenly become uh, expert in culinary, become chefs or cooks at home. Yeah. Wow. So uh, as far as possible, 
we will modify the contents of uh, what we uh, put in our media into things that uh, can uh, that can bind yeah, the attention or the excitement of the uh, audience uh, to stay at home and enjoy our media. Uh, continuous, uh, that's why uh, now the personalization of uh, our digital platform is very important yeah, because people from time to time uh, they uh, send data to our platform so uh, we, will be, we will be able to know uh, whether they have new preference now yeah uh, how they use uh, how they use the platform uh, how they pick the selection of the programs yeah uh, how they interact with our social media things like that so all these uh, then we change in the media side, for example, our uh, UI and UX, we modify, uh, you know, the, the way we put our uh, programming, uh, planning and scheduling. Also, we adjust, yeah, things like that. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the challenge is, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking or communicating with our uh, advertisers because uh, our main uh, revenue is from advertising. Uh, and this also not a tough one because uh, the brands uh, they are also I would say in uh, still in uh, shock because of the current market situation. Yeah. So uh, maybe nobody, even the big or small corporation, they experience uh, something like this before. And so uh, a lot of uh, big advertisers as well as advertising agencies is like still learning how to cope with a new situation like this because for example in the past uh, usually if there is a short uh, problem in the market they can still advertise for increasing the market share but not anymore because probably increasing the market share is not really something that they need now maybe they're more in the survival uh, survival mode now so uh, we need to keep communicating with our uh, customers or our clients yeah, understand what they need. From then on, uh, we need to create uh, we need to create uh, new packages for them, which is uh, enable to enable them to to think long term as well. You know, uh, so uh, profitability mode maybe is number two for us. Number one is more how to keep our customers still uh you know uh, doing business with us yeah how to encourage them yeah, to uh, still maintain uh, the exposure of the business in the market and how to help them to uh, reach into their customers yeah because uh, again uh, like in my first the first part of my explanation the consumer behavior has changed so perhaps uh, the way to enjoy a cup of coffee is also different now uh, they want to be creative. Yeah, for example, in Indonesia, uh, a while ago, uh, there is a viral, uh, a viral thing about Dalgona coffee. I think uh, Sovian and Pak Kelvin also knows this. So suddenly they make a different variation of coffee. So this kind of thing uh, has, has some important elements. Yeah, because it uh, not only concerns coffee, but it concerns milk. It concerns sugar, it's also cream and flavors, things like that, plus other things. So this is just one small example. So that's it, yeah? Thank you. Yeah. So so one, one thing for sure, uh, coffee shops around Indonesia or around Southeast Asia, they need to start uh, bringing in some more magic into the coffee and for sure have Dalgona coffee right on top. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they will have Dalgona coffee on the menu after this. <laughs> So, so past, past Sofian, so since uh, you're part of the e-commerce ecosystem over there, uh, so e-commerce companies uh, were hit from multiple sides. Now from, from manufacturing and procurement because of the lockdown, manufacturing went down, then uh, the supply chain becomes tough to keep up with. And then, of course, people are not buying enough. People might be going in for essentials only and not for anything else. Uh, so at a time like this, uh, how how where does e-commerce go henceforth? Yeah, thank you, Nakul. I think it's a continuum. What Pak Daniel said. Uh, I think it's uh, first of all, uh, we 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 have to 
clearly what is the change. We have to have a collective awareness about the changes, actually. Now every company entering the learning curve together. Uh, in an uh, e-commerce perspective, I think uh, there are a lot, uh, not a lot uh, changing because, you know, e-commerce uh, uh, by design is already digital, already virtual. But there is some things uh, changing at the moment, for example, uh, payment method, for example. Indonesia, is we know about the cash on delivery. Now it's really decreased and I think uh, soon it will be, will be gone. So uh, people move uh, from the cash on delivery to become uh, e-money or digital money. And second thing about the logistic, like you mentioned, uh, we have to adjust uh, a little bit about the hygiene, how to to make sure that physical distancing, we, we follow the rule from the government. Yes, of course, uh, that's why uh, we believe that we have to be uh, proactive at the moment. We, 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 we don't see uh, this pandemic if we become a hit one company because this is the, the all company, right? So we have to see the all the ecosystem. So of, of course, our approaching with the ecosystem also. So we have to know what's the uh, government regulation, what is the, com uh, the community wants about uh, the product and also uh, what is the market. For example, the other things we uh, recently, we have a, a survey that the category that what people buy is uh, shifting now. Before they, they, they like to buy, for example, electronic fashion and so on. Now they move to groceries. Uh, uh, healthy things, healthy uh, medical tools, and so on. So uh, e-commerce is, I, I say, I can say e-commerce is the way out, the solution at the moment for the people can buy. Uh, so it, this is, uh, I think it's a blessing in the sky for this uh, moment, at the, for the pandemic at the moment. So, so uh, I, I heard yesterday in Indonesia, there's a, uh 51 percent new buyer at the moment new seller they they put all the things uh for example for the um uh, small medium enterprise they put all the things in the uh, e-commerce at the moment and this is the good things for indonesia actually okay that's it well, thank you pa sofian uh pa kevin what what's your take on this the fundamentals of business Okay, um, so uh, in my experience so far uh, running with Gramedia, right, I think one uh, resilience formula that we see is working even now is about counting the customers, really. So um, as Pat Sofian also has said, like in the, in the situation of this uh, pandemic, uh, e-commerce is a solution. Yes, um, Gramedia.com experience uh, 5x, uh, 5x of uh, sales compared to the normal days actually um, we, we um, so uh, what we find effective uh, actually there are, there are two things uh, one is regarding uh, regarding how you haunt your customers meaning uh, how you approach your customers uh, from the very beginning so we in Gramedia we believe in omnichannel right so from the very beginning uh, we have built this foundation of omnichannel where we have our the data of our customers, our current uh, customers, both in the stores and in, in online. From the back, in, we are we are already uh, running it right now, and um, it is about reaching those customers because, um, uh, like in our case, really, um, we are selling we are selling one of the most consumed item, especially during this isolation, which is uh, actually books. Um, it turns out, it turns out people, um, at least according to our data, uh, people read more during uh, during the pandemic. So uh, it is actually a, a good thing for us um, that we can reach our customers uh, despite of uh, a lot of our stores uh, being closed right now, closed temporarily right now because of uh, because of the lockdown isolation and such. And secondly. Uh, when it comes to the supply chain, uh, we are also lucky that uh, as a group, uh, we actually have the whole supply chain. So, so in the case of books, for example, we we are the product, we are the manufacturer, 
we are also the last mile uh we are also the last mile uh, player so we have all the supply chain uh together so uh, currently what we are really uh tweaking is how to make this uh supply chain you know, work even better for our customers um and also uh like since our our stores are closed down we are looking at those stores uh not as uh, not as store, but as fulfillment centers. So, um, like the way the way we run our business right now is uh, really on the consistency, uh, consistency towards how omni channel uh, works in its form. So, uh, this is what uh, I find uh, working very well uh, for us. And by the way, uh, in terms of content, actually, uh, coincidentally, uh, what uh, Pat Daniel has said just now. Uh, actually resonates a lot with us. Like so, lifestyle lifestyle content like cooking books and stuff actually sells more during this uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, is my take. Thank you, Park Elvin. Uh, yeah. uh, Saki, what's your take on this? Uh, what what how how do we start looking for a formula for a pandemic proof business? The fundamental. Yeah. Yeah, so I would I would like to talk from the Netco's point of view, right? I think things were unprecedented, and I think uh, nobody could have planned for it. But I think what kind of worked for us and what stance which we took was while the new acquisition was taking a hit in terms of the overall scenario which was there, milieu was not favoring. So we kind of took a stance that we are going to be with our customers who are our existing customers. How can we go? to an extent to help them in whatever initiative which they are trying to drive, how can we be more closer to them and how can we help them in executing the campaigns which they want to do. And overall, the communication was more towards the retention side of it that how our customers kind of retain their customers and give them a better experience. Mm -hmm. So the communication to our existing customers were also around it, that how do you kind of take care of the current situation. So that was on the, I think, fundamental level, we kind of approached the uh, overall business that uh, in this scenario, we need to hold the code and we need to kind of uh, be with our customers uh, to support them in whatever way possible. On the opportunity side of it, while uh, we categorize clients in terms of uh, positively impacted and negatively impacted. So you would see not all the verticals were impacted, while you will see the upsurge in the online, the impact was on the retail side of it and offline side of it. So on that basis, we have seen a good transition happening on the D2C side of it. Mm -hmm. So we kind of re started to refocus on D2C side of it. So so these are the two things which we de did in terms of so how do we look at the existing business and how do we look at the new business. Now coming back to your question that how can we be, be uh, shock proof and how can we be an avoid this anti-epidemic sort of scenario. I think uh, it's basically to do with uh, how are you changing with the time and how are you kind of sticking to the fundamentals and keep on reiterating things, uh, keep on reiterating your processes, which is kind of is the best fitment for the time right now. I don't see there is any uh, theory written for this, that this is how it should be done. So that's what I would say. So, so you, your suggestion is keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. and Keep thinking. Keep, keep experimenting, yes, yes. Keep experimenting. Uh, so that brings me to my second question. Uh, now, all of us here are talking about, uh, you know, we're doing well online, everything's coming online, which means we can expect a lot of competition come online. Uh, now that, that the offline stores are, are, are closed, uh, it has really pushed people to start selling online, which, which is new competition. And, and usually this competition would have taken about two years to get online. But this has happened in a matter of two months. Uh, so, so right from OTT platforms uh, to e-commerce companies to maybe competi uh, competitors for the media uh, and, and competitors for Netcode as well. So we're looking at a more competitive landscape online. And, and maybe that, uh, uh, so pa Daniel, my, my question to you here is, yes, there is new competition coming in. Uh, so how, how do existing leaders uh, take care of this competition? How do you ensure that you still rule uh, in the market? Uh, you're asking whom? Uh, pa Daniel, this is for you. Oh, me? Okay. 
All right. So uh, talking about competition, I think uh, yes, uh, this is good time to talk about them because uh, unfortunately we are really, really uh, you know big, big uh, competition now going on for us, uh, especially in our digital business. Yeah, because uh, now the competition is not only local for us but uh, also global. You know, uh, the big guys like uh, Disney now is aligned with Fox. Uh, they have their own uh, Disney Go. Yeah, which is uh, they form their own OTT business now, and uh, we know that they really, really have uh, big, big uh, movies like Marvels and so on. You know, so of course they have uh, really, really uh, exciting content. And also, the HBO group also is very, very uh, aggressive now, and bring it to the uh, Asian as well as South Asian Asian market. And also, of course, uh, our longtime friend uh, Netflix now is really aggressive entering all you know countries in asia and indonesia suddenly because of the endemic somebody said that netflix and pandemic is really uh how do you call it? it's like mass making in in heaven or i don't know maybe in hell <laughs> they have their big luck with uh, the pandemic with the corona yeah because now suddenly everybody is sub subscribing to netflix so all this of course uh creating a big competition for us media company that's why we need to understand the uh, leverage or competitive edge that we have here uh, in MSC Group, which is basically the local content, because uh, uh, no other companies like us have uh, the the biggest uh, library of local contents, which is now uh, Netflix is trying to do so, but of course uh, catching up, uh, you know, our uh, number of years we get because we are uh, since 1989, so it's still a long time to catch. But Netflix is, uh, you know, they have uh, almost unlimited funds, you know, to produce their own original series. So, uh, yeah, we are leveraging what we have now, yeah, uh, which is our expertise and our library. Uh, and, you know, uh, we try to, of course, uh, safeguard our, our uh, market share here in Indonesia with uh, our expertise, which is uh, how to capture our audience heart with... Uh, long uh, with a long time i would say darling of local contacts in indonesia so uh, i think every company have to know uh, what they have best yeah perhaps uh, later on pak kelvin uh, of course uh, have also uh, rich history with gramedia and compass group uh, they are also very old company and of course they must have their own uh, uh, i would say competitive edge for us here we we have a captive captive audience and uh, also, our free-to-air uh, TV station, RCTI especially, that's uh, the number one uh, TV station here that we really, really use that. And of course, uh, then uh, we align with our digital platform, RCTI Plus. Yeah. Um, so a lot of uh, creativity going on in terms of uh, creating uh, new features in our uh, digital platform. And also in combination with uh, doing a lot of creative uh, creative repackaging of our library content. So this is uh, what we do in, in, uh, in the terms of how we compete with the market of uh, international players coming into Indonesia. Got it. Uh, pa pa Sofian, what's your take on this? New competition, what, what do existing brands do online? Yeah, uh, before we know, uh, every company they're focusing on asset heavy, right? Now they move to platform heavy. So I think, uh, I believe all the company that they have, uh, uh, they will more competitive when they put in all the data in the platform. So I think it seems, uh, I'm in education industry. Uh, Akupinta is one of the application that help the, the student for mapping their talent to be, uh, to be majoring in the university. So we see the competitions, uh, number one is the important thing about the, uh, in our education uh, industry is the collaboration. So in, in the competitions meaning uh, how we can collaborate with the others company. For example, we collaborate with the school, with university, with the uh, teacher, student, uh, uh, CSR from the company. So we make it the one ecosystem and then we can share the value each other. So the competition meanings for me is not only for 
we have to head to head to the other company but how we can collaborate and we can share the the value uh, itself so uh, i i believe is the the pandemic is one of the effective uh, transformation agent i can give you the example for example uh, in indonesia the teacher and the lecturer it's it's very hard to to uh, uh, saving from the uh, face to face in the class and using the digital platform and now because the pandemic now they move to uh, virtual uh, uh, method is very easily so that's why i said this is the the, the transformation agent the very effectively at the moment so now we trying to make the integration and collaboration uh, between our stakeholders so we can make uh, give the the value uh, to the others uh, with our stakeholders that's my my point kevin okay um so from me i guess uh, as pak daniel said right um our group is a very old group um so uh, with all group uh, comes uh, comes big brands with all groups uh, comes uh, brand integrity um, trust and so on so the way the way i see uh, i see us uh, facing the competition uh, later on really is how we uh, we utilize what we have right now meaning the brands we have the the trust we have from the customers the network we already have for uh, this uh, 50 plus years and uh, help uh, make that relevant also in the digital world so uh, that is why uh, that's why we are really a true believer of omni channel meaning we utilize what we have we get our brand uh, our our network and also we expand, them, expand them our extend that uh, uh, trust towards our uh, online assets so the way the way we see it really the way we see uh, everything as uh, all this as our unique value proposition really is how we approach uh, omni channel right now because we have the names in the the brick and mortar world but we are we are also um, i think we are we are making a very very steady uh, progress uh, in the digital world also so i think this is what uh what i i deem as our unique value proposition towards our competitors so 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 the heritage the the heritage the trust is is what will what would that's that will push your ship forward is what you're yeah. saying yeah so so it is about reutilizing what you already have uh it's about it's about uh using what assets so instead of looking at uh, our old company stuff as the way it is we we are seeing it as the power that will will uh, take us uh, even further to the next level especially in the digital uh, competition now nowadays got it uh, sakit you have a quick word on this about competition yeah so i think all the while uh, we were talking about right a lot of companies are splurging money on the acquisition side of it and i think we have been kind of a strong advocate about to focus on retention and kind of giving a right experience to the customers so i think while it has come with the epidemic i think not a right time but i think if you look at a realization for the brands have started happening that how they how they do communicate and how they uh, take care of their accounts and their customers that has become a prime facility now and on top of it the personalization in terms of the experience which they are giving it to their customers so with the kind of offerings which we have today in the market it is making it even more stronger so if you look at retention where what we are also coining a line like uh, retention is your new acquisition so the kind of amount that you are spending on acquisition if you are able to retain your existing customers you will be able to make more revenue out of it so i i would say retention with the help of giving right experience with the customers is going to be the core competency which we are going to build upon Correct, and uh, that will differentiate. Yeah. Correct. So, uh, uh, since since we are running short of time, these are the last two questions for my panelists here. Uh, question that that has been asked by uh, by the audience and and when we during the time of registration itself. So fundamentally, it's cash flow. It it is finance, 
um, that that finally has to see what is to be done. So mm-hmm. for, for aspiring business, uh, I mean businesses that that are uh, struggling to get out of this situation right now, businesses that are thriving, uh, and and for people who are looking to start a business, uh, fundamentally they need to see how how do they manage their finances, how do they manage the finances of the business itself. Uh, so I would like a word from my panelists about cash flow management, about the pillar of finance. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, pa Daniel, I think Pa Daniel is on another. Uh, so let's move to Pa Sofian. So you you asking about the how to manage the finance in a startup company? Uh, so across so uh, for people who are struggling right now, for people who are starting up, and for people who are thriving, so we have all three kinds of people here. So uh, <laughs> for in my company at the moment is uh, cash is the is the king now. So so we have to uh, manage all things. We have to restructuring all the uh, transaction, how we deal with the customer, how we deal with the uh, vendor also. So yes, we have to very. Uh, careful about the finance aspect since uh, we don't know uh, uh, you know all the country at the moment they they has mentioned about the, the economic growth will be decreased uh, Indonesia already uh, declared that uh, we decrease us more than 50 uh, percent since uh, last year so we, we don't know yet till uh, uh, when the pandemic is is finished so that's why we have to keep uh, we have to restructuring we have to um yeah we have to trying to to manage the best we we can do for example how to manage the the employee half they can entering the the office and the other we have to when they working from home so yes i i believe that that's uh, at the moment all the company is struggling how to manage the the finance at the moment okay. Uh, okay um so in terms of marketing, uh, focus more on uh, retention in term, uh, instead of uh, acquisition. That will be the cheapest right now. It is uh, basically, uh, you know, bluntly speaking, is to exploit your customer even more. Uh, whatever, whatever you can dig out, whatever you can, you know, uh, exploit even more from your customers. That's what you do right now because that's the cheaper way to acquire sales. That is fun. In terms of uh, in terms of operational uh, measuring measuring uh, every single KPI will be great. Meaning uh, you have to make uh, you have to make people to be even more productive, uh, a bit more productive, even more than before the pandemic. So uh, efficient uh, efficient production is super important uh, right there. So I guess like uh, from my point of view, these are these are the two things that will help uh, that will help us uh, survive, really, uh, throughout uh, throughout this pandemic. Got it. Uh, pa, da- pa Daniel, can you hear us? Pa Daniel, I think there's some network issue over there. Uh, so Sakit, so how, how do companies uh, look at finances? Are we looking at it differently? What are we doing? Yeah. Yes, uh, I think it takes us to the fundamental question. I think we seem to be kind of uh, missing on that fundamental aspect that uh, the prof- the uh, main goal of a business is to make profit, right? I think all of you would have heard the goal, right, from Goldred Ilyaru. That happened to be the fundamental. Like that's what I kind of uh, got a lot of uh, values from that book. And I think that is the essence which we are kind of losing it. And now that is kind of pushing us to come back and look at how can we kind kind of make a profit, keep profit in the center and then work towards, we do not compromise profit for the growth. And we and that is the kind of philosophy which brands kind of take. It will help them in terms of becoming a little bit softer. Otherwise, mm-hmm. an epidemic like this or any other turbulence like this can really sweep them away. So I would say that will be the fundamental. That will be the fundamental thing which I would say after this epidemic, which we, the companies will have to think about and they will force to think about. And rather, rather than becoming a unicorn, how can they become profit on? So that is the kind of thing that they will have to look at. So, so, so uh, you're only as valuable as your profits. Yes, yes. Got it. Uh, Pat Daniel, do we have you here? Um, 
I think we still have the network connection. Okay, so this is my last question to the panel. Uh, so you you have one minute, uh, and and anything, any word of advice for uh, the three three types of people I told you about. One, people who want to start, and and right now they're confused of what to do. Point number two, the people who are already there who are struggling and and they're trying to survive. And point number three, people who are flourishing. Uh, so. One minute per person. If you have some advice to give, uh, the floor is yours. We start with Pasofia. Yeah, I think at the moment it's a good time for people can innovate more. Uh, I believe that uh, business pressure is always there, and a pandemic is is I, I like I mentioned uh, before that pandemic is one of the uh, effectively transformations uh, that everybody may have to change. And have to adapt with the uh, business pressure, all the business pressure. So I think uh, that's uh, the way for us to creating more effective, more innovative about anything, about how we can uh, make our product very attractive to customer. How we can change our uh, business model. How we can attracting with the more. Uh, value proposition with our markets. I think this is the good time for, for us actually. So when we, we have a very good value proposition to our offering to our market, so mm -hmm. this is uh, the good time for us to 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 win the market. Okay. So part of, does that mean you know, focus on the value proposition, the core value? Yes. So the core value will define your success. Okay? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pasofian. Pa Kelvin? Okay. Uh, so for people who start, I think um, it's about if you really have to start now, especially in this pandemic, uh, you have to choose the right niche. Uh, what what runs? If not, wait. Uh, just um, have whatever money you have to survive. That is that is one. For people who, who are you know already running but still struggling. Still struggling, especially throughout this pandemic. Survival is the survival is the prime, uh, most important thing uh, to be done. Meaning, uh, if you survive now, if you maintain your business, and especially if you can see the potential post pandemic, era, then you surviving this, meaning you will have a jump start ahead of a lot of your competitors. So. Uh, I think uh, that will be that will be the key thing to be done. Therefore, uh, therefore, as Sofian has said, value proposition is super super important. And then, uh, and then, uh, another thing is the plan to jump start. The plan to jump start is super super important too. Whether you are starting a business or you already have a business that uh, you are still running and still uh, struggling with. So these these are the two things that uh, you have to keep in mind. It's just that if you start, if you have to start, you you choose the right niche. If not, then uh, you should um, like. So you should wait. You should wait and see. So that is for me. So so some, summarizing your advice here: if you want to start, start with a niche. If you're if you if you're somebody who's struggling, then just just survive. Get yeah. to the pandemic because uh, th all the pent up demand there's growth on the other side. Yeah, a and and if you're thriving, you thrive. You are, okay, if you are thriving, uh, I don't think you should be happy about it um, because because the the market itself in the, during the pandemic versus the post pandemic is will uh, I believe will totally be different. Like for example, you if you you sell masks today, then mm. you won't see that that many masks being sold post pandemic, Who knows, right? And sanitizer, for example, like if you sell it now, you may not sell as many post uh, post COVID. So, mm. it, um, I think it is it is at the uh, at at the opposite uh, opposite direction with the one who is struggling. Struggling means you are thinking for the potential. 
the thriving ones maybe you have to think about what's your next plan so that uh, customers your customers are still engaged and entertained and want to buy uh, your products that that will be uh, something that uh, need to be uh, need to need to be think about so one small example if you are in agriculture you may experience search in uh, direct to consumers uh, market right uh, people buying online for for groceries as part mm -hmm. of Yen has mentioned before but after the pandemic you should think about a b2b process because when the pandemic ends those restaurants cafes and hypermarket will be your biggest customers so this is what uh, you have to think about thank you thank you pa uh, uh, pa daniel uh, we just got word that you can hear us yes yes i can hear you please yes pa daniel so uh, we're summarizing our discussion over here pa daniel uh, the last question for for the whole panel here is what's your advice for people who want to start and are confused for people who are struggling struggling right now and they don't know what to do and for people who are thriving hmm. well i am always struggling all the time <laughs> i think everybody is <laughs> okay i think uh, i live with the uh, you know, young people doing startup. Uh, first of all, number one is uh, they have to understand first, uh, you know, their specialty and their uh, passion yeah, in doing business, as well as uh, what leverage can they do, you know, what uh, whatever they have. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of people, uh, perhaps uh, they have passion, but uh, they don't realize that it's very difficult uh, at this pandemic situation to get the funding, for example. So uh, it has to be very carefully thought. Yeah? Secondly, is that uh, we need to always be quick uh, to adapt and change, yeah, because uh, in this kind of situation, especially when uh, we are now entering the new normal uh, or the new reality of uh, you know market of uh, the social life and also business. Uh, actually, we don't know what's going to happen next. So uh, whatever that we do. Uh, we need to be alert yeah, uh, with the market situation and uh, we have to quickly uh, adapt and change uh, that, for example, uh, in the platform side, like uh, I have mentioned, also in the repackage, repackaging of our contents and things like that. So what we are doing is that uh, we anticipate the market taste, audience taste, uh, probably change after, uh, let's say, two, three months, uh, they've been staying at home. Perhaps uh, it's not going to be like that later on the nightlife will be different uh, the way they do entertainment also different perhaps uh, the malls will not be as crowded as before and uh, so uh, everything like this we have to anticipate so, uh, what is the necessary uh, measure to be taken yeah, to increase efficiency and productivity because uh, now we have to be uh, very very careful with our cash flow management yeah it's not so easy to to get a new business or people uh, are spending their cash very, very uh, frugally now. They they don't want to. Uh, they 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 see more value now. Yeah, because uh, lifestyle. Perhaps uh, in the past uh, they like to to uh, buy coffee in you know uh, Starbucks or whatever, which is like three five dollars a cup. Now maybe not anymore like that. They will be more cost efficient and saving you know whatever that has value for them. Yeah. Coffee probably only one dollar, even uh, fifty cents is enough. Uh, they won't spend three, four dollars anymore yeah, for a cup. So uh, finally, is that uh, we have to find the right tools, whatever that uh, we are doing in our business. So uh, in that case, for example, Netcore have uh, for us very important uh, feature, which is personalization. Yeah, because now everybody wants to be very personalized. If they buy something, services, product, and everything. Uh, again, it has to bring them value and to satisfy the personal uh, needs and wants. Mm. Finally, uh, in every bad situation, in every gloomy sky, there's always silver lining in the cloud. So I think we have to find the silver lining. We have to find the opportunities uh, because always opportunities arise from any uh, situation, even uh, the worst situation. That's all. Got it. Thank you so much, Pa Daniel. Uh, you mentioning the silver line. Reminded me of, of a great thinker who said, you will see a silver line when you have a silver line on your face. So when yes. you smile, you will, you will find your silver line. Uh, <laughs> so, your, your thoughts? 
Uh, we can't hear you, Saket. No. No. <laughs> I think the sil silver line over here is <laughs> is the internet connection at this point in time. Uh, got it. Uh, Saket can. Uh, no, not at all. I, th I think it's something to do with your uh, internet. Okay. Uh, no, Saket, we can't hear you. If you uh, can, you can you write to us in the chat section. Can, can you write to us in the chat section? Uh, your right side, you will see chat. Please write to us over there. Now, while Saket writes to us, uh, so. Thank you so thank you so much, pa Daniel, pa Sofian, pa Kelvin, and Saket for yeah. for being here with us for for being so patient. Most welcome, most welcome. Uh, yeah. And before I let you go, this is this is one ritual uh, that we always do. Uh, which book? So which book have you been reading uh, lately? And then which one would you want to suggest? And is that something you want to suggest here? Yeah, I do. Yeah, pa Kelvin, let's start with you. Okay. Um, how to measure anything, Do uh, Douglas Hubbard. So it's a book about uh, measuring the intangibles. Uh, I love that book because it actually teach you uh, how to quantify literally everything. So I think that will be that will be a very very nice book uh, for everyone, especially during this situation. If you can if you can quantify uh, quantify the actions, the behaviors, the uh, uh, the model of your business and everything that will help you survive through the pandemic. Thank you, Park Ellen. Pa Sofian? Yeah, I'm, I love to read the, from the Jacob uh, Morgan. Yeah. Uh, the future work, the, the future of work, how to attract a new talent, build better leader and creating competitive in organization. I think for this uh, situation, that book is very insightful for us. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Sofian. Uh, pa Daniel, you have a recommendation for us? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch your, the question. What was uh, the question? Uh, which which book have you been reading and, and something that you would want to suggest? Wow. Uh, I don't know whether this is going to be relevant, but uh, I'm, I'm reading about the minimalist now. <laughs> okay. So I think, uh, give me a bigger perspective about life, yeah. Uh, during the pandemic and as well as the pandemic, I think it, I found it very interesting. The minimalist, uh, basically, is about philosophy of life. Yeah? Not only physically, you know, we have to let go and uh, be uh, be minimalist with, you know, uh, with our house and everything. I think uh, this is like uh, pushing the reset bot button of our life. Yeah, mm. uh, we cut down what is not necessary. Uh, we we put more value. Uh, in our life, because uh, for me, this is going to be reflected in the market as well. Uh, the minimalist meaning uh, the essentials, yeah. So we have to go back uh, to what is uh, the consumer will find it essential for them to have. So this will affect uh, greatly on the way we do business. So thank you, thank you for that, part. Uh, Daniel. In fact, the crowd loved it for for all those claps and all those. Thum, uh, thumbs ups coming on your screen. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to go by the, the minimalist. Uh, Saket, uh, which is which is your recommendation? Uh, no, we can't hear you. Uh, Saket, can you write to us on chat? Become anti-fragile. Don't only survive, but become better. Opportunities will come up. Thank you. Thank you, Saket, for that. In fact, I will go pick up become anti-fragile. That's something that I've been wanting to do. Thank you so much, my, my patient panelists. Uh, thank you for, for the audience as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will end, we will end uh, the session right here. Uh, you can stick around in the social lounge, uh, speak with people uh, that have joined um, to understand what to do next. Uh, and we will see, see you till next time. Thank you. Hey, bye. Thank you, everybody.